on this episode of the Contagious Influencers of America podcast. We're talking humble beginnings for the musical McIntyre family. We were too small to have a marching band for football and whatever. So she said, hey, went to the school board and said, we've got some kids that want to be musicians here. And uh, so our art teacher, history teacher said, well, I'll teach it. Give me one hour a day. They went and bought some equipment. They got some drums and guitars and stuff. So we had a Kiowa cowboy band. And um, my brother, Paik, was the lead singer. He was the band leader. And then me and Reba were uh, backup singers. The queen of country as a backup singer? Well, that's just part of the many stories we're going to hear on this episode of CIA with our guest Susie McIntyre, Reba's sister. Hi, I'm David Sams, and uh, I, I really enjoyed having Susie here in the studio, you know, uh, this is such a, a an amazing family, such a talented family, and she's going to talk about uh, traveling on the road with uh, with her brother and her sister, and how she found her own niche in the um, in the gospel country genre. And uh, she's so loved all over the country when she travels, and she's going to tell some of her stories and some of the stories about their childhood and uh, how the. Uh, the matriarchs of the McIntyre family tree really help shape uh, who these girls are today. And of course, she's all part of something called uh, Jesus Listens. She's, she's, she's actually the spokesperson, uh, which is the latest from the Jesus Calling family of books. And it's a, it's a devotional that was uh, recently released with, uh, oh gosh, I think they had a million copies in the first printing or something. It was just crazy. But uh, she's going to share all these great, great stories and talk about some of her triumphs and her comebacks and uh, getting through some difficult times with uh, with their past marriage and all that. So uh, we'll get right to that in just a second. But uh, I, I, I have to ask you, are you frustrated with your health insurance plan? Uh, do you feel that it costs too much or doesn't meet your needs? Well, I got to tell you, you're not alone. And there is good news. You're not stuck with it. There's another option, and it's called MediShare. There's huge savings with MediShare. The typical family saves some $500 a month. You also get a massive doctor network and a free 24-7 telehealth option. Not to mention, you get to be part of something that uh, you really believe in. MediShare is a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills. No wonder MediShare gets double, that's right, double, the customer satisfaction ratings compared with the typical health insurance company. It's also a great option for many of us who have changed jobs or are now self-employed. Call now, 833-32-BIBLE, 833-32-BIBLE. Call MediShare at 833-32-BIBLE. Well, Susie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here, David. It's great to have you here. And, uh, you know, you have... Um, oh, first of all, let's get the business out of the way. we got to get the business out of the way because uh, they want us to handle the business. That's right. Yeah, then we can have some fun. Mm-hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, kind of thinking that you'll probably have fun taking care of the business, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're just that kind of guy. <laughs> so so uh, tell me about Jesus Listens. Jesus Listens is uh, Sarah Young's second publication, of course, with Jesus Jesus Calling that you see everywhere across the country on just about in every bookshelf or uh, tabletop. Um, I don't know how many um, reprints it's had, but it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've given it away for graduation gifts, for wedding gifts, whatever. It's her second publication, and but it comes from a different point of view. It becomes... um, a prayer it's a prayer every day to lead and help people that have difficulty and how many of us don't have difficulty just taking time to pray leads us into a prayer and from what i found out in looking at this book and reading it has caught me in the moment that i am Uh, she's very intuitive she spends a lot of time with god and i think when she writes those things down it will hit people where they are and encourage them to go to God. Sometimes instead of a friend who has an opinion, 
but go to God and say, God, what about this? What can I do? And uh, in fact, it gives us solace. It gives us uh, strength and it gives us a different perspective. So, so you mentioned that the, the, this, this, uh, this project came to you at the right time. What do you mean? Well, I think it came to me at the right time. One thing is I am I have got time for it. Um, to be able to be the spokesperson for Jesus Listens, I have the time because my uh, touring schedule is, is pretty low, as other people have been the last year. Um, and I think that's really sad because if you want to uh, – if you want to cut people's lifeblood off, cut music out. Um, example, I asked my daughter, Kate, yesterday, I said, hey, does your second grade teacher use music in her class very much? And she said, no. Last year, when she was in first grade, she would come home with songs that her teacher had taught them to learn certain things. And she would just belt them out at the, you know, and then I asked her, I said, do you use music now? And she said, no. And her face was kind of sad. But my mama taught us music when we were growing up and music is like medicine it's like laughter it's like it's a medicine it soothes when you're driving through a snowstorm in the middle of montana which i have if i hum to myself my blood pressure goes down Uh, music has a profound message and a profound effect on people and um, we need that and so anyway to get back to loss of music uh, in the midst of what we're going through right now, I believe we need this book in front of us every day to remind us not to depend on what we're hearing around us, but what is true, solid, and impactful in our lives. So, so this is something you really believe in. It's not just you're not just the uh, hired gun, right? No. <laughs> 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 no, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm not just the hired gun. I am not. I believe in it. I, I did. Um, I, I was the uh, second season host for Jesus Calling, and um, uh, they took a lot of the episodes of podcasts and video from interviews from a lot of people, a uh, whole season's worth, and they um, kind of just piped me in so I really wasn't there I watched the interviews and I knew what these people what their story was but I didn't get to know them I didn't do the interview the best interview came on Jesus Calling it was the second to the last episode where my sisters uh, Alice Reba and I sat around a table at Reba's house here in Nashville and just talked about our faith and what influenced our faith and how we grew in that faith and um it stemmed from our grandma our grandma smith and um she was big on prayer and um it it was like when i was growing up i was the fourth of the four kids and when i was ready to go to school my mama took a job Because my daddy was a rodeo cowboy. He won, but it wasn't enough to really take care of the bills at home. So when she went to to work at the superintendent's school uh, office as a a secretary, and so when daddy couldn't keep me on the ranch, she would make sure that the school bus driver would come across and come up and get me and then take me over the hill and across Boggy and over the uh, the, road. a cattle guard and park at grandma's house and let me off and let my aunt on you probably couldn't do that nowadays but (laughs) (laughs) but when i would stay for with her for a few days i would watch her life and my grandpa was not a very he was nice enough but he was he had a temper and she had to deal with him and she dealt with him very well and she was patient but she was a Pentecostal lady. She didn't cut her hair. She didn't wear pants or britches is what we call them in Oklahoma. But every night before she would get into bed, she would get down on her knees and she would pray. And I saw that as a little girl, preschool age, and that made an impact on me. She was patient. She was kind. She worked hard in her garden. She didn't have a regular uh, washer and dryer she put her clothes out on the on the fence uh, I mean <laughs> you uh, you got exfoliation from your towels when you dried off 
because they were air dried. They weren't put in a downy dryer. And um, <laughs> she did all of that by hand. She milked cows. She had, you know, she had uh, the fresh butter, fresh milk, fresh eggs, made the best bla- blackberry cobbler you ever lapped a lip on. I mean, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. And so to see her pray and to see her work ethic and her love for me and her kids and her grandkids and she wasn't she wasn't exuberant about it she didn't go a lot of places cuz she never got her driver's license she had a second grade education and yet she influenced so many kids in our family all of us cousins and i told Reba and Alice that day look at the ripple effect that my grandma, who hardly left home except for Saturday to go to town, the ripple effect that she has had in her life, and to see her pray and to make an impact on us, and then me being able to be here today talking about Jesus Listens and how important that is to be reminded in our busy day and all of the things we have on our phone to stop and she reminds me a lot of my grandmother. I, mean, I, th- I think she went out twice a week. Once she went, to, th- that I recall, she went to church on Sundays. Yes. And I think they got in a car and went to the grocery store on Wednesdays. Oh, well. It was something like yeah. that. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't remember her ever going to like an event or to a baseball game or Ooh, any of that. No, my, you know? my she grandma was on the farm. never did. No, they yeah. never did. They never came to any of ours, uh, our basketball games. I doubt that she ever went into the gymnasium at our school. Hmm. No, and I'm, him either. I'm sure my grandma probably did that because my dad and his twin brother, they were basketball stars in high school. Oh, so boy. Yeah. If she didn't go to their games, and oh, I, I, I can't imagine that. But Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, but, she was a homebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, the power of prayer and how it has – tell me a time in your life that uh, that, that that's uh, – that, that, that your prayer was really what you had to. Well, I I knew you were going to ask me. I, I knew you were going to ask me that, and I I, I wrote down uh, how real can you and your listeners talk? Mm-hmm. Very. Do I look like I can't? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. My first marriage was very abusive. My husband was very abusive, and you know, and I have a lot of mercy and grace for him, mainly because I've got three kids by him, and um, they love their dad. But um, for 26 years, we tried to make it work. I mean, we were in Nashville. We we wrote a book, you know, um, uh, with Broadman, and and we um, about how you can overcome abuse. Um, well, maybe the hitting stopped, but the emotional and verbal abuse never stopped, even when I filed for divorce. And so one day, uh, this is a pretty cool answer to prayer. I uh, was sitting at my office and he came in and he was frustrated and he towered over me and I was sitting in my chair. And I remember looking up at him and he said, uh, why can't you do this and how come you can't keep up with that? Uh, and he told me how, how stupid I was, how ugly I was, how inept I was. And as he was telling me this, I asked God to drop him. I honestly did. And I mean, I'm a Christian artist. I sing and I go to churches. My husband's a pastor. Um, but honestly, I was so fed up. We had already separated once. He had gone through and we had been with the best counselors in the country. And yet this couldn't be fixed. And I said, God, you can do all things. I know you can. I said, why don't you just drop him? And so he rides off on his horse, goes up in the hills to check on cattle. I said, perfect opportunity. (laughs) And uh, so I I thought, oh, man, that was bad. I just wish my husband dead. I just committed murder. I'm 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 doomed. What am I doing here? So I went and I went to my bedroom and I cried. I literally cried tears, David. I was so frustrated, not just for myself, but for my kids, you know, because what you see in your in your parents and growing up, that's what you live. And, you know, unless you make a really, really good determination not to do that. So I went to my bed and I was crying to God, crying to God. I said, God, why don't you do something? And in the quietness of my heart, I swear. He said, why don't you? 
And I thought I had done. I thought I had done what I was supposed to do. And it was then and there that my heart turned. I questioned, what do you mean? Go for another, go for another silly separation and, you know, threaten him one more time. This is the end. He said, why don't you? Growing up, the fourth of four kids, you think Reba's outgoing? You hadn't seen Paik, our brother. And those two together can't outdo our older sister, Alice. I was the fourth of those kids. They wound up doing everything for me most of the time. I was a true baby of the family. They're, they still try to. They still try to brother and sister me mm-hmm. all the time. <laughs> and so I think it was God saying, Susie, grow up. Take your stand. And you do something about this. You change this situation. Nobody else is going to do it for you. His friends are not going to straighten him up. Accountability people are not going to straighten him up. He has to realize if he doesn't change, he's going to, he's going to lose it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got up from that bed and I said, okay, God. Now that would be hard for a lot of people to, to stomach because God's against divorce, but isn't God against someone berating someone like that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Doesn't that sicken God's heart? Mm-hmm. So I went to God in prayer, and he gave me the answer. And that was the um, quickest and most definite answer to prayer that I've ever had. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So for somebody who's uh, listening to this right now who is in a, uh, finds themselves in a similar situation, um, and they just, uh, you know, maybe they got a couple little kids, and they're looking at mm-hmm. those kids, and they're, they're, um, they're, they're, it's a tug of war, right? What do I do? I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you went through counseling. Oh boy! Right. Yeah, several times. Several times. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, for somebody going through that right now, when do you absolutely know <laughs> that's that's it? You could just can't live like that anymore the and i hate to go on statistics but statistics are that narcissism isn't cured i mean it'd have to be a really just a miracle of god to be cured um it's such a satiating um mm, mental feeling to be dominant over another person and it's almost like a drug you know when they're that way um i look back first of all I should have gotten out of that marriage. Uh, We were married in November. By March, he was abusing me. I should have got out of it then. But he didn't want to be that way. But if I would have looked it up, if I would have gone to counseling immediately, oh, they would have said, we'll work with you. But it's hardly ever reversible. Mm -hmm. It's it's a sickness. And um, abuse, abusive people... It's hard for them to turn around. I would say you need to go and you need to protect yourself and you need to protect your kids. Uh, you don't have to take the drastic measures that I took right away, but you need to uh, you need to protect your kids mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. Um, I always say this is probably not very proper either. But um, my mama would say it, so I'm quoting her: uh, "Damned if you do and damned if you don't." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have gone under scrutiny if I would have ended my marriage when my kids were little. And I thought, I'm going to have to deal with him anyway, so why not live with him and so my kids don't have to go from house to house? And then, I've, if, and then I waited, and I still had to deal with him, and I still was under scrutiny. Uh, but I was proud of the Christian community because I was at the height of my career in music, and only one church ask me to bow out of a concert because I was divorcing. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. others applauded me because they are realizing how damaging abuse is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people can people can abuse from across the room. They can give you that look. And old grandma can be abusive, you know, spatula in hand, you know, just give you a little look and your heart crumbles. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have to be bruises. Um, it can be emotional, verbal, physical. It just needs to be stopped. You need to have enough respect for yourself to get out. So um, 
let, let's go back to your childhood. What set the stage for me? What was uh, life like around your your home? And um, tell me about the your 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 music roots with you guys. Yeah, well, our um, growing growing up years home is still there. My my oldest son EP is uh, still living in that house. It's been renovated several times, but it's still in the same spot. And when I walk into that house, I I, I can it, memories just lots and lots of memories. Um, us kids, four of us, mama had four kids in five years. Alice was five when I was brought home. Um, mom, daddy had just built this house and it was, it was, it's well built. I mean, it has not fallen down yet, but he, he wasn't a carpenter. And so he kind of built it on the ground with just a the rocks you know for the corners and a few things you know in the middle but we've had to replace the floor quite a bit the the roof's good though <laughs> they're, they're like <laughs> one of our twelves together <laughs> um but anyway uh, our home was was good it was um reliant a lot on mama and since mama's passed away which was uh march in 14 not 14 um in 20 Mar- uh, march of 20 um our family's not as tight knit i think a lot of people would say that it happens and um mama kept us together with music mama kept peace when we were going to the rodeos uh daddy was an only child he was raised on adults he didn't know what to do with these kids and there was a bunch of them and they needed clothes and we would be going to cheyenne wyoming to the rodeo and we'd be having fun in the back seat and pretty soon daddy's arm would be up on the back of the seat and that was one morning and then if it dropped there's your second warning and then if it came back to get a pinch pinch a leg or something or or swat us and tell us to be quiet it was like <laughs> the red sea would part <laughs> go for the and and the older ones got the doors and we and me and reba always got in the middle because we were the low men on the totem pole and so that was easiest for daddy to get us but um uh, as far as um I, and i've been thinking about this a lot david um preparing for this um a lot of people say well you know i just i just don't know if i want to pray i i just can't pray i you know and a lot of people think that god's up there on his throne and he's this big judge and i think a lot of times it our perspective of god depends on who our daddy was who our earthly father was and my daddy, he was a hard worker. He was under a lot of pressure. He had a lot of goals. He wanted to have land and cattle. When he died, he almost had 20,000 acres. And he worked himself to the bone. And as he lay in the nursing home, he said, if I would have known it would hurt this much, or if, and sometimes he would say, if I would have known I was gonna live this long, I wouldn't have uh, worked so hard or something like that. Um, he was so driven that he was very impatient with us. And I was thinking about this. I, um, I kept my granddaughter, Kate, this past week. And as she would talk on the phone with her daddy, I yearned. I yearned for the ability to have had that kind of relationship with my daddy. I couldn't already talk to him, much less sit on the phone with him. He was an authoritarian. He was one, if you heard his pickup coming up the hill, you grabbed a broom. I would more times than not go to the back porch, start a load of laundry, and grab anything dirty and put it in there just to show him I was working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's how driven he was. You better be doing something. Mm -hmm. Don't count your money. Don't be playing games, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I yearned that day for something lost Mm -hmm. and something I never would get back is a relationship with my daddy that I could just sit and talk, Mm -hmm. just sit and talk. And it kind of warped me with my kids because 
I'm always having to be somebody or uh, ask them how they're doing or anything like that. And um, I, uh, and so it, um, it went into my relationship with God mm. just to sit at his feet, read Jesus Listens, September 27th. Your worries, your cares, your, I know that you're going through these things, but here I am. Mm-hmm. So, no, God doesn't care about that. He wants me to work so I would stay busy mm-hmm. instead of sitting down and being still, which is good for my whole body, my mind, everything. It's good for me just to sit still. Nope, I got to be busy. I got to get these tasks done. Finally, at 63 years old, I have learned that the tasks are never done. There's always going to be something to do. And if I don't take care of my emotional and spiritual life, I won't have anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So our, I believe in my life, and I, I think my other siblings are like this too. In our growing up years, our mama saved us because she introduced us to music and she was a taskmaker too. She'd be frying mountain oysters and she'd have her spatula up and say, no, you're on the wrong note. You need to come down a little bit and you need to do this. And she introduced us to something besides ranching and rodeo that we, three out of the four of us, could make a living with the rest of our lives and enjoy something that we were destined to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she was very instrumental in our lives. Yeah. Okay, so who's the third singer? There's you, Reba, and who else? Our brother, Pake. Okay. Yeah, he had a top ten uh, hit, and uh, Reba kind of took him under her wing, brought him to Nashville. He was the lead singer when we were in high school. Mm. I was in junior high. They were in high school. So Mama was the superintendent's secretary. They We were too small to have a marching band for football and whatever. So she said, hey... Um, went to the school board and said, we've got some kids that want to be musicians here. And uh, so our art teacher, history teacher, uh, Clark Ryan, um, said, well, I'll teach it. Give me one hour a day. They went and bought some equipment. They got some, you know, drums and guitars and stuff. Peg already had his. So we had a Kiowa cowboy band. And um, I was probably in the seventh grade uh, the first year I got to be a part of it. And um, so out of that band, my brother, Pake, was the lead singer. He was the band leader. And then me and Reba were uh, backup singers, and my cousin, Diana, and uh, Carol Johnson. And um, the the drummer was our art teacher's brother, Kelly Ryan. And then our bass player was Roger Wills, who still plays for Alan Jackson today. Hmm. So <laughs> most of those kids went on and made careers out of out of music. Pake's still playing today. And so it was it's it was a really really neat neat experience for us all. But you you and Reba aren't singing back up anymore, I take it. <laughs> when he's around. <laughs> <laughs> he still thinks he's the star, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because and then we would uh, oh, he was diligent. He would get the album, you know, like Merle's album or Conway's or whatever. And of course, you know, it was an LP and mama had one of those big um, pieces of furniture where the radio and then here's the, uh, I wish I still had it, and the uh, the album player, the LP. And um, he would go over there and he'd get his piece of paper and his pen and he'd, okay, and then pull it up and he'd write it down. He'd put it down, listen, pull it up, write it down. <laughs> People don't even do that anymore, do they? <laughs> <laughs> and then they would write the, they'd put the uh, lyrics on the back, and now you just look it up on the internet. Yeah. 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 So much easier. When, when did you know that uh, you wanted to be an entertainer? I didn't. I didn't. I, uh, they had to make me sing lead on songs. And, um, who, who, who did? Oh, the, out, uh, Reba. Reba and Peg. Yeah. <laughs> you were you coerced into learn. it. <laughs> oh, in our in in our class we had to sing lead on one song. So I picked um Ann Murray's um uh Beneath the Silver dun, 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 I will fly away with you. 
Um, anyway, what is it? Bird? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one. That's so hard to <laughs> say. One. I got that one. Um, and so I, I did that. And no, I was, I would, my knees would knock mm-hmm. really bad. So I went to, um, Reba got her contract in 75. It broke our trio up. Um, Pake went his way. I went to, went on to high school, finished, went to Oklahoma State University to study accounting. And uh, when I got out in 80, she asked me to come and sing back up with her. So I got to go on Johnny Carson. I got to go on these radio tours. And uh, it was just really, really cool to be able to sing with her. And um, since then, I met my husband, my first husband, Paul Luck Singer, uh, at the National Finals Rodeo in 1980. We got married in 81. And then I got pregnant with my first um, little boy in um, 82 I stopped singing with her and went home and was just at her office I, I kept her books mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so after I which, had which worked out well for her <laughs> yeah it did it worked out well for her but um, I, they told me to go cheap on the hotel rooms but but you know you're booking you're <laughs> <laughs> You're booking on the telephone, and you have no idea where. <laughs> yeah, this you know there was no internet, no pictures back then. <laughs> so I got we're so I got spoiled a few complaints. today. <laughs> you did. <laughs> How many times were there bed bugs involved? Oh, bed bugs and um, ladybugs. So um, yeah. Anyway, uh, anyway, I I got to where I they said okay up up the criteria a little bit anyway. So. Um, was that fun traveling together? Oh yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. It was. It was lots of fun. I enjoyed Reba. Uh, we would giggle and laugh, and I got to go on the Opry with her, and um, I was with her when she got her first bus. And I mean, before that, um, me and her and Charlie, her first husband, uh, we traveled in a in a Lincoln Continental, and the guys were in a, a van and a trailer, and. I mean, it was meager, meager mm. beginnings, yeah, and then yeah. she got a bus, and it was fun. And so, uh, um, it then then I got pregnant, and then I needed to quit. And then in 1984, I, my husband and I, um, went to a church that I knew the pastor for forever. He graduated from the same school that I did, and loved him, and he. Uh, Went in, I went in that church, and it was like I started crying. It was like, I think I've come home. What am I supposed to do here? And our that was three years of marriage with him, very abusive, very um, hurtful. And so it was like I reached out to God, and I said, God, I want to sing for you. So in 1984, I started singing uh, nothing but Christian lyrics. I said, I'm just going to sing Christian lyrics. And I was so used to singing with a band, but I couldn't afford a band. He was a rodeo cowboy, so we would go to these cowboy churches and cowboy church services at rodeos. And so I started getting tracks from Christian World in Oklahoma City and around, and I I started recording. And and, uh, then in 1993, Integrity Music contacted me and they wanted to sign me and so they said who do you want to pattern your music after I said I love Paul Overstreet I love the way he takes good positive lyrics it's country uh, and it's very encouraging I want to do that and so I recorded an album with them two albums with them and then I went with uh, New Haven Records Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the rest of them I've just done on my own so um I, it's amazing to me, and I always said I would just go where God wanted me to go, and I have, from 1984 to 2021, I've had booking agents, it didn't work out. I've had managers, it didn't work out. Word of mouth and people saying, hey, would you come here and would you come there? has worked out for me that I never lacked for a place to sing mm-hmm. until COVID. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. COVID has shut yeah. things down. Yeah. But yeah. I still get to sing on Cowboy Church on the RFD channel and the Cowboy channel. 
Um, tell me, tell me about that because I, you know, years and years ago, I went to Cowboy Church someplace. Maybe it was here in Nashville. It could have been. I, you know, it's probably when I lived in LA and I came here maybe in the mid '90s. I vaguely remember mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And it was quite unique. Uh, so tell me about Cowboy Church. Uh, tell me about the history of that, because you said you kind of started that way, and how that has uh, evolved. But at the same time, it's it's it, it has its roots where where mm-hmm. it is, and and mm-hmm. now it's do, you're doing this R- yeah, RFTV TV thing, which is pretty cool, right? Well, there's uh, three mediums. Um, you have a church that is on the ground solid and mostly uh, most all of them are in texas because of the southern baptist they planted those churches and got them started or you have events like the national finals rodeo in las vegas we will have cowboy church at south point casino in the bar 10 30 in the morning on december 5th this year um we also go to um guthrie oklahoma the timed event um it's in march we on sunday morning we have church Uh, different places like that and all across the country there will be cowboy ministers at different rodeos that have church service for these people because you know they're not home on sunday so they need a place to go and then the third avenue is on rfd tv and the cowboy channel what what we do at russ weaver's church in uh texas is gets filmed every week and then they plug me singing something from somewhere. And uh, so it's on, and there we get, we get letters. We're totally donation. We get letters on donations, not from the typical Texas, Wyoming, Montana, places like that where you would think that they would love cowboys or be familiar with the cowboy life. It's from Long Island. It's all over the place, Pennsylvania. They just love and they relate to that Western way of life. There's something about a guy with his cowboy hat and he's got an aw shucks mentality, the realness of it, that they relate to and they appreciate it because there's a lot of people that are shut in. They, you know, they're elderly. They can't go to church anymore. And if that cowboy church ain't on that Sunday, they are ticked. I mean, they, we get letters. Why did they have something else? We need cowboy church. <laughs> so they, they really rely on it. And, and it's good to be needed that way. It really is. So, so one of the things we do, we have a uh, lovestories.com where we are finding, uh, uh, where, well, bo- the bottom line is it's uh, Jackie Dorman. And uh, she's a Christian matchmaker. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's brought thousands of women into this and uh so i guess i should be telling her about this because it sounds like this is a good place for these women to meet a cowboy (laughs) cowboy church it probably is well you know when i was uh, when i was exclusively singing at churches you would see more women at church than the men at cowboy churches there's predominantly more men than women or at least equal so there you go ladies there the secret's go. out there you go there you go and they wear hats <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff it, yeah i mean i think if anything the number one advantage of cowboy churches is that it's brought the guys back out mm-hmm. you know that's They're, interesting yeah it is it is an interesting phenomenon whether i mean and instead of a basketball court in the back or a gymnasium, they have a roping arena mm. where they can do little play days. Kids can ride their horses. They may have team roping, calf roping. Uh, they have that kind of activity after church. So it's really cool. Real and cool. in some cases, it's in a bar. So uh, you know. <laughs> Exactly. More, than, more times than not. <laughs> Uh, for sure. Yeah, we, there's no bound. I mean, Jesus didn't go just into the tabernacle. He went everywhere where people needed him. And I've long past got got past that, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. not going to necessarily meet him in church every time, but um, he meets you where you're at. So where's the mo- mo- where is the one of the most interesting places? Oh, I mean, boy. just think about this a minute where you've ever experienced uh, Jesus. Interesting places. Mm-hmm. Well, have it. A... That was that was that one place. That one place where where in your life where uh, Jesus just showed up. I was at uh, the Christian 
is it Christian Broadcasters in San Francisco? It was during when I was recording with Integrity. They took me out there, and you go from booth to booth to booth to booth to do the interviews and, you know, be seen and publicity, selling your product. And um, I, I got into back into my hotel room, and I felt so alone. I was by myself, San Francisco, doing what I was supposed to do. I mean, I was a grown-up woman. I mean, I could take care of myself. But I don't believe I've ever felt so alone in all my life. And I turned on the radio. And in what we all think, apart from California, I thought of all places, I probably am not going to find anything friendly. And Christian radio popped up. And that was the most soothing And I don't listen to to Christian radio a lot. I'm sorry. But that was the most soothing balm to my soul that day that I've ever felt. I felt like I had a friend in the midst of no one else around. And um, I believe God, God, he talked to me that day. I believe he orchestrated that for me and said, you are not alone. I'm here with you. And in the midst of everything that's going on in this, um, in this world, um, Jesus listens, uh, author Sarah Young, she, she has three points in, in her talk about this and she's not well right now. And yet she went ahead and she got this book ready for people who are struggling. And, and I forgot to tell you this a while ago, but my grandma told me, when she said, you don't have anything else to pray about, or you can't, you don't know how to pray, just say, thank you, Jesus. That's the main thing. Thank you, Jesus. And I wrote this down and I, because I get, I I get far and far and few between, but, uh, it, it helps us to focus on his problems that he, uh, (laughs) it helps us to focus on not our problems, but his promises and that he's a good and just God and that he will never leave us or forsake us and um, that he's in control. I I went out the other night during this harvest moon and I was just like, oh God, thank you so much for being so faithful to us. Who couldn't think that there's a, not a God? Who could think that that just happened? And that everything is so in motion and it all comes at the exact point in time. How could they not believe in God? It just doesn't happen that way. And then we have praise. And praise gives, makes us so aware of his presence and it refreshes us. And then it strengthens our confidence that he is in control. And then she says, the other thing that she was taught to do when she was in theological um, seminary by a professor, he said, your best, your best bet on a prayer is help me, Holy Spirit. Help me. Help me. And when you don't know what to say, when you don't know how to pray, he intercedes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will intercede with prayers that we have no idea that go straight up to God. So... I, um, I, I've enjoyed Jesus calling because it, it hits on what I'm going through, through the day. Um, I try to be in control. I try to plan my days. Uh, by the time I look at my day at the end of the day, it's like, did I ever do anything that I planned? And it's usually, nope, Mm -hmm. things supersede, things come in, things disrupt my day. And, um, so for her book and her readings, it reminds me that we're not the only ones that's going through these things. Um, the enemy would try to like, um, put us over in a corner and keep us away from other people. Kind of put us, put our nose in the corner. Don't talk to other people. Don't interact with other people. So we don't know that we're not the only ones that's going through this stuff. We think we're the only ones. And if we, these prayers cause us first to, we aren't the only ones. And second, 
We've got to go to the Lord and vocalize what we're going through. My husband's good, but um, if I go and vocalize, he won't just, he's better than most. He, he might interject his opinion. He might say, well, she was right. You shouldn't have said that or you, you know, but God quietly sits and listens and he lets us kind of mull it over for ourselves. And pretty soon it's, um, we get a fresh perspective on what we need to look at. I think we need to go to him first. So, so you remarried. I did. Why in the world would you do that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, mm, well, it was kind of a miracle, David. It, um, I went to uh, Cannon Beach, Oregon for the Cannon Beach Conference Center. Uh, Been there several times. I had been separated from my first husband for two years. Never saw anybody that I was attracted to. I was in front of hundreds of people. I was just trying to just live my life and um, get a, just breathe, you know. And um, I was booking my own stuff. I was carrying my own suitcases. I was telling sound men what, how to start my music and doing pretty good. And went to Cannon Beach and the guy that was speaking was from Colorado. Well, he had a friend from Seattle and he invited the Seattle friend to come down and spend some time with him. And so on my way over to the, the supper table that night, um, I talked to Harv, the speaker, and he told me that, uh, well, I'm, we're, we're a little bit late for supper, but my friend's later, so he'll be here in a few minutes. And so when we got to the table, everybody was there. And so I politely left a scooted over so that Harv's friend could come in and sit down. And when he arrived, angels sang. No, <laughs> <laughs> I had only been officially divorced for one month, and he had been divorced um, a year. And um, Mark walked in, and he had already spoke at this conference many times, and he knew most of the people around the table. And he came to me, and he said, you must be the singer. And I said, yes, I'm Susie. And he said, Susan, in his Northwest uh, arrogance. And I said, no, Susie. He said, Sue. I said, Susie, you'll excuse me. I need to go and do sound check. So, um He heard me sing and he heard my story a little bit. And the next day he asked me if I would like to go on the beach. Uh, He had a car and um, he'd been there before. And if I would like to ride, take a ride down the beach. He picked me up at um, about two o'clock and and we told each other our stories. And 18 months later, we got married at the Christmas conference Hmm. at Cannon Beach. Hmm. And um, he's changed my life. Hmm. So there is hope for, for those of us who've, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now you two work together now, right? Oh, we you do, travel yeah. together and. Yeah, we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does that work out? Oh, he's the easiest person in the world. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday when we were going to town, he was, he wasn't, ex- yeah, he just wasn't as excited about getting there as I did. I was because I was going to sing and he wasn't going to speak. And I kept looking at the, at the, um, as foot feed and um i was like uh could we go a little bit faster um he was he didn't do it on purpose he was just thinking about other things he's easy to be around he's so insightful he's the best speaker i've ever i've ever heard um he was raised in the northwest by really good parents and he's got three grown children that are smart educated and have are wonderful parents um He's, um, he just lost his marriage. And, Mm -hmm. um, so it was a miracle of God that we met, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it was orchestrated of God and, uh, we're hardly ever two feet apart. And, uh, he, he has men's groups. He ministers to, to men, mostly in bars and, um, he talks to them and he helps them. And, um, he's just, he's good. He's my workout partner. He's my singing partner. Um, we love to cook together, <laughs> and he loves my kids, and he loves my grandkids. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's really beautiful. Thank you. And you've been married for how many years? Uh, going on 12 years this year. Wow. Yep. Yep. He's a good guy. That's, that's... Mark Eaton. And he's the reason that we got involved with Jesus Calling, mm-hmm. because um, they had asked me to tell my story about abuse, 
and then uh, they asked him to share his story, and then he uh, really got a good um, friendship with Michael from Harper Collins and Laura from uh, Four Eyes Media, and uh, then they asked me to host Jesus Calling, and then now. I'm the spokesperson for Jesus Listens, and mm-hmm. I think it's a great book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that, uh, is that, uh, where, where do you see things going in the future for you? Uh, I mean, so many people are pivoting after this whole uh, huh. yeah. crazy year and a half, two years going on, two years of this uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I mean, I read something the other day that, you know, we, we all sort of say, well, if they start, stop handing out the money, people go back to work. But the reality is, if mm-hmm. you really look under the hood, I, I've read more and more stories of people who've had a year or more to sit around and think through things mm-hmm. and do research. Some people have gone back to school, community yeah. college. Mm-hmm. Some people just don't want to be a, a server anymore. Right. I mean, I, I think we've all got, kind of gone through what's what's the next chapter. Right. You know, right. I mean... It, it, you know, uh, they say it only takes 28 days to rewire your brain. Mm-hmm. Well, when you've had a year and a half. <laughs> where is the wire? Where, where, where's the wire? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I I know people are probably tired of me telling this story, but when it started out, I went through that and I started walking three miles a day. Now I'm up to eight miles a day. Wow. And I do it every day. Cool. And now I've started fasting 18 hours a day. Wow. And it's all because of this pandemic. Uh-huh. It's, I would never have done this. Right. It's like I would have had... Breakfast, mid breakfast, mm-hmm. lunch, afternoon snack, mm-hmm. dinner. <laughs> I mean, look at yeah, you are a lot smaller. I can see from the pictures right now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's all because of the pandemic, right? So, how, how do you think your life is going to change? How are you pivoting? Well, your family. It it has pivoted in that I have been home a whole whole lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, my oldest sister is influential in the rodeo world in Atoka, Oklahoma, and they had a professional rodeo there. Uh, they've got two rodeos a year. But this one in, in for sure, they honored the uh, past champions, and one of them was our father, Clark McIntyre. And so they asked me to sing that national anthem when we were sitting there and we were being interviewed. And I said, usually I wouldn't be here this time of year. It was in July. I would be on the road somewhere doing a concert, fair, rodeo, whatever. I wouldn't be here. And I've done that for the last 30 years. And I've missed out on being part of my community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know people here. I don't know what's going on here. And so that in July... And then just this past Sunday, we did a community church service at um, at our football field for homecoming. I got to be involved with that. Mm-hmm. I got to be a part of our community. Mm-hmm. If it hadn't have been for if, if COVID hadn't happened, I probably would have been on the road mm-hmm. and not be a part of that. So hopefully I'm there more for my community, but more importantly for my grandkids you know, my little granddaughter, seven years old, she lives right over the hill. And so I get to be that grandma that I had at that age, mm. at the almost exact age. And uh, she loves her m- Momo and she talks to me and I hope that continues for the rest of her life. So my career, I mean, I love to sing. I was just getting where I really enjoyed singing to the fullest and to be able to sing without reservation because if you are an abused person you get get real tight there were times i couldn't even open my mouth Mm. to sing much less enjoy singing and and i with mark's help with his love with his reinsurance with us being able to live together and uh, he tells me i'm beautiful and tells me you know all of these things, mm. I was just beginning to flourish mm-hmm. again. And um, and then it goes away, you know. Um, but anybody that listens to this, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> to, hey, we put on a daggum good concert. <laughs> now, now, go back a few years when it was you, Reba, and your brother yeah. singing. Um, and, and obviously, she explodes 
how did you guys handle that? Did you say why not me? Did did your brother have a fit? I mean, uh, what? what? It was well, there jealousy? Uh, no, no. Well, no, no. We weren't jealous. I mean, uh, she reached back and got us both and, and helped us. And uh, my gosh, uh, I mean, there was no really. I mean, there was there were already. And they told us this. The Nashville guys told us this. You know, there's already. I don't remember who they were. um Maybe the Browns, maybe the, you know, Winona, and they, that was a little bit early for them. But, you know, there's just not a real need for trios. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we don't think we could do that, but we can push Reba. And Reba said, I'll help you guys all I can. Mm-hmm, well, mm-hmm. when Reba doesn't have to say a word. I mean, and I realize that. I know God called me to do what I do. Mm -hmm. But when the bio says or when the advertisement said she's Reba McIntyre's sister, there's two things happen. People come because that's the closest thing they'll ever get to Reba, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and and they'll get to me because I stand in the lobby. But uh, (laughs) (laughs) and they'll call me Reba. And um, (laughs) and there's also a huge responsibility and a little bit of a uh, i don't know if i'm going to be measuring up you Mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. to that Mm -hmm. but i got asked back several times from all the places i've been so Mm -hmm. i guess they were pretty well okay with what i did i i i don't think there was jealousy i think we were very proud of reba we knew that reba had what it took to do this she's got a work ethic that never fails i mean she's still working she's out in la doing sheldon you know it's like she mama told us when she was little she was so busy and she wouldn't sit down she was just always going i mean she she walked early uh she just wanted to be out in front of people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she and i had this little conversation one time and i said you know when, when i go to a place i'm really not sure if i'm really wanted there or not you know and everything she said really she said i think everybody loves me (laughs) yeah i guess so i guess you're reba mcintyre and she said no even from the beginning i just figured you know when i go in here people gonna like me and i Mm -hmm. like them Mm -hmm. no qualms about it and you know that shows up it shows up and she's got a great work ethic and a lot of people have said You got the same work ethic? I said, yep, that came from my daddy and my mama. And I feel like when we are hired to do a job, we do 100%. We're not late. We're early. And we're ready when they call us. And um, sad to say, but that doesn't always work nowadays. But um, Mm -hmm. it's not cool to be on time. Well, this has been fun. Thank you. uh, This has been fun, Susie. And and, uh, I really appreciate you stopping by the homestead and... Look forward to. I'll have to check you out on RFD for with the Cowboy Channel. Yeah, and uh, the, of course, the Jesus Listens is is out. Yes. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much thank for you. stopping by. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you, Susie. Thanks for stopping by the homestead, and thanks for sharing those great stories about uh, uh, growing up and. Those uh, stories with your brother and your sister, and what boy, what an amazing family, the McIntyre family. And they've been so incredibly uh, supportive of one another over the years uh, as they have each found their own path in the music industry, and that is just so, so cool. So, uh, hey, please do me a favor. Share this podcast with others. It'll bring them a lot of encouragement. And I, and I have to tell you, uh, I would also recommend, and I really mean this, please go rate and review us because we need those five-star ratings. That's how people find out about us. I would really appreciate that. And uh, if you if you want to check out the other, uh, the other uh, episodes, it's really easy. We've made it very, very simple. Simply go to contagiousinfluencers.com, and there you'll see some, uh, what, 140 episodes or so. And also, uh, if you want to check out our radio website, you can do that at keepthefaith.com. And we've got all kinds of great content there, including past episodes of the show. And they're all based on themes. You know, they're timeless. They're they're, they're evergreen. 
So if you happen to be going through this mood or that mood, there is a show, there's an episode there for you with the best music, the best songs, the best stories, uh, just waiting for you there at keepthefaith.com. And most of all, I have to ask you this, uh, you know, the world's been a little crazy this year and uh, it's, uh, oh gosh, over the last couple of years, actually. So mm, all I got to tell you is uh, just keep an open mind, uh, spread a little love, and most of all, go out there and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living in black and white, don't you think? I'm David Sams. See you next time here on CIA, Contagious Influencers of America.